Can you see my screen now? Perfecto. Y te oímos perfecto también. Yes, it's good. Hablamos en inglés o en español? Inglés, English, please. <laughs> We're gonna get killed. Okay, am I ready? You totally ready. One, two, three, go! <laughs> okay, good morning, everybody. Uh, happy Labor Day. As you know, in all over the world, we celebrate Labor Day, so we're not supposed to be working today. <laughs> but this is just a hello from Santiago, Chile. I just want to let you know that this is the way Santiago looks today. Basically, this is the <clears throat> Valley of Santiago, and this is a view from my clinic. Well, the topic of today, it's a very interesting topic because we've been working in relationship to this very, I would say, interesting observations clinically that we see in our everyday practice. And it's related to the concept of the importance of occlusion that we've been basically talking all these days about it. But we have to realize that we're dealing with a very sophisticated system that deals with a very, I would say, a misleading observation. For many years, when we talk about cranial mandibular disorders, headaches, facial pain, temporal mandibular joint problems, we usually see on the screen a cranium with a mandible, but we forget that it's not only a relationship between the cranium and the mandible, but we also have to take into consideration everything that is happening below the cranium and below the mandible. And not only below, but also in front and the back, which is prevertebral, paravertebral, inframandibular structures that are extremely important for normal function and to maintain a physiological state of rest. So we define a physiological state of rest as a position of the least amount of intrajoint pressure, the position of least amount of connective tissue tension, and the position of the least amount of EMG muscle activity, basically at any joint. So it could be the temporomandibular joint, or it even could be occlusion as being also considered as a joint, the process of keeping joint surfaces of the teeth together in a stable position with all the structures related to the physiology of the mouth also in a state of rest. To be able to adopt that position of rest, we can not only think about cranium, mandible and teeth, because the head is supported posteriorly to the cervical spine and the cranium is related to the mandible. And finally, the stability of the system is given by occlusion in a stable resting position. So we have a concept that is called the tricentric joint relationship, craniovertebral, craniomandibular and occlusion. But for able to find then that position of the least amount of intrajoint compression, the position of the least amount of connective tissue tension, and the position of the least amount of e muscle activity, we have to consider this tricentric relationship in a different way. If you look at it in this lateral view, look at the tremendous amount of muscle function that are related to the cranium, the mandible, and how the mandible is related to the shoulder girdle through very large groups of muscles, inframandibular, prevertebral, lateral muscles that relates the cranium to the sternum, to the shoulder girdle, large amount of muscles relating the cranium to the posterior back of the spine and the shoulder girdle. So this is a very large area of information. Now, looking at this concept through the years, we have the opportunity to go through different processes of observation. We started initially by seeing everything in a sagittal position. Everything was sagittal and it still is a lot of sagittal observation trying to come out with a 
three dimension diagnosis. So the growth of the technology has taken us to look at it, not only sagittal, but then we started to look at it coronal. But now with the increased information through the technology, now we see it on 3D. So now we can see it axial, coronal, and sagittal. And that is what has been probably the main, I would say, support of technology in trying to understand this tricentric relationship. So we've been going through an update of the diagnosis and treatment of this concept of cranial cervical, cranial mandibular, and the synovial temporal mandibular joint. It's no longer just a temporal mandibular joint. It's a synovial joint that has to follow the principles of synovial joints for that physiological state of rest. What for? To keep our patients away from pain, headaches, facial pain, or joint pain. So we started doing our observations in a different perspective. So now we see, for instance, the importance of the coronal transverse occlusal plane and how that is related immediately to a congruent cranial vertebral centric relation. That when we lose that concentric relationship of the cranial vertebral joints, we load immediately the synovial temporal mandibular joint, which will take us into a progressive of maybe joint degeneration and pain. So today, the importance of the temporal fossa is becoming extremely powerful in the concept of physiology of rest. What for? To be able to have a normal relationship between the fossa, how the disc relates to the fossa, to finally try to find a position of the condyle stable on the disc and the disc remaining stable on the fossa. So it's a different perspective of observation of our system. So what is keeping us together? The cranium, el cranio. And this cranium, of course, is very interesting to observe because this is what's gonna keep us together the position of the cranium in space and the relationship of the cranium in relationship to the rest of the body. If we look at it, we can see that the cranium is articulated anteriorly through the fossa, the disc, the condyle, and all the connective tissue that is keeping the joint together, capsule ligament structures, and the muscles around the cranium and the system with an occlusal relationship that you know more about that than me, but it's absolutely necessary for stability. But when we look at it in a different perspective, look at the cranium now posteriorly. You can see the large amount of joint structures that we're gonna see, the large amount of muscles that are attached to the cranium that is giving you a perspective of observation where you're gonna have a relationship of the cranium anteriorly, which will give you a 50% observation of this functional system. So when you do a cranium mandibular diagnosis related to occlusion, joints, etc., you're only doing a 50% diagnosis. We heard a little bit about that this morning in some of the lectures before. But if you look at posteriorly, the cranium also relates to the upper cervical spine or to the spine in general. So we have the cranium divided in two functional systems, a cranial mandibular and a cranial vertebral, each one with differential diagnoses independent that we cannot isolate. So the cranium is giving us 50% posterior and 50% anterior functional relationship that you cannot isolate. So when we try to observe this concept of stability of the cranium, basically mainly related for symmetries and proportions of the face and symmetries and proportions of the mandible for a symmetrical concept of symmetries and proportion. 
So when we look at it initially, and we look at the skeletal observation of the cranium, we started looking at it through images. And this is an anterior, posterior, transoral x-ray. But it's a medical x-ray that gave us probably the most important concept of observation of how the cranium is sitting on top of the upper cervical spine related to cranial vertebral joints. But if you look at that, you can see that the cranium that is sitting on top of the upper cervical spine as cranial vertebral joints, then you can start thinking that the mandible also has to fit to the cranium relating the stability of the mandible independent, but dependent from the position of the cranium in the upper cervical spine. So we started analyzing this. What was the first observation through this transoral x-ray? That if we look at this second cervical vertebra, which is axis, C2, has a very interesting structure, which is the odontoid process with the vertebral body, which is a very strong vertebra able to support the total weight of the head through an element that functions actually like a disc, which is atlas. So atlas is relating to the occiput and is relating to C2 axis, functioning in between these two structures, cranium, C2, as a disc. But that position of C2 is dependent in what is called a skeletal midline that crosses the maxilla, crosses the odontoid process, crosses the spinous process of C2 that is at the center of the body of C2 and crosses the center of the mandible. So it gives us a skeletal midline that is common for the cranium, the maxilla, the cranial vertebral joints, and the mandible. It's just one skeletal midline. When we see that, when that skeletal midline passes through the center of the body of C2 and the odontoid process, the transverse occlusal plane of the mandible becomes horizontal. So it's a cruciate system that is going to be quite interesting when we see a little bit of the anatomy of the relationship of these structures. What does that give us then? It gives us a parallel relationship to Atlas that is also going to be horizontal when axis is on a skeletal midline. And that allows then the maxilla also to be horizontal, parallel to atlas, and horizontal, parallel to the mandible. Now, in this observation, you can see that that skeletal midline is only one for the whole system, as a cranial vertebral, cranial mandibular Mariano, functional give, give it a try to those uh, earphones that Lena te va dar. I can't hear you. Okay, what do you what are you telling me? I didn't hear you. Let's see. No, que teníamos mucho eco. A ver si con esto nos mejoraba. Okay, how is it now? It still sounds, I think it's the microphone, the one that is creating the, the echo. We, okay, we uh, hear here como un robot, se suena un echo. <laughs> I, am a, I am a robot. You know? I know, Robocop. <laughs> oh, I didn't want to bother you before, but I told Natalia and she called Lena, so I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> that's, a, that's okay. Well, I was just trying to refer to the concept of the skeletal midline that crosses C2, odontoid process, and spinous process of C2. That gives us a common skeletal midline for the maxilla and also for the mandible. So it's just one skeletal midline that allows the maxilla to be horizontal atlas to be horizontal, and the mandible to have transverse occlusal plane okay. horizontal and parallel to each other. I'm going to put now... No worries. Believe me that 
people is thirsty but to listen to you so we will wait Ahí se escucha mejor. Eh, a ver, uno, dos, tres. ¿Me escuchan? Sí, te escuchamos. Can you hear me? Mucho mejor. Mucho no, mejor. ¿Y tú? Better. No, pero si sí, ahí sigue yendo. Ya tiene. Honestamente. Ya, yeah, Mariano, so, como, como sea, quítate lo que sigue lo, casi lo mismo. So, donde te es... sientas más cómodo. Tú tranquilo. Sí, yo creo que es, es eh, el internet tuyo debe estar un poquito bajo, pero don't worry. It's okay, let's keep going. Ya. Yeah. ¿Y ahora cómo se escucha? Ahora perfecto. Un poquito más duro, pero ya no hay eco ninguno. Let's go back then to our basic of relation. No, ahora no, wait. What happened? I don't know, está como traqueando. Y se oye muy lejos. Your voice is very far. Sí, se oye muy lejos. ¿Qué te pus que pusiste un eh... Y pues de ahí mismo se, se habla. El micrófono está ahí mismo pegado. Del audífono. Divino, ¿Cómo se siente ahí? Better. Better, Better, pero hay eco. Y de, con el otro no hay eco, pero no se pero oye la voz. Pero no se oye la voz. No, no, no. no, no, no el blanco. El blanco es el audífono. ¿Este? ¿Y de allá? Pero me dijeron que se escuchaba el a ver, vamos a ver. ¿Y ahora cómo lo escuchan? Igual que con eco, pero sigue, así está bien. But the, no but the, voice, the voice is clear, though. Yeah, the voice. The echo at the end, yeah. yeah. Perdóname, sigue, tú tranquilo, <laughs> no ha pasado nada. Okay, Esto lo editamos is... después, so tranquilo, dale. This is... Rockabato Robot. <laughs> okay. oh, Rockabato. <laughs> <laughs> okay. We know now that we have only one skeletal midline passing through C2 that allows us to have a transverse occlusal plane of the mandible parallel to an horizontal position of Atlas and a transverse occlusal plane also horizontal parallel to Atlas of the maxilla. This allows us a very interesting kind of situation. Everything has to be, as I said, on a skeletal midline. So we will see how the cranium is related to the upper cervical spine, going through the spinous processes of the upper cervical segments. Okay, interesting position because when we have this cranial vertebral aligned in this cruciate system, vertical and horizontal, we will have symmetry in relationship to the craniofacial region. And we see that in this case, the orbits will also be at the same level, parallel to the maxilla, parallel to atlas, and parallel to the transverse occlusal plane of the method. This is the concept of symmetry related to cranial vertebral joints. But as you can see, this is gonna be again a 50-50% concept. So we're always analyzing a 50, 50 percent anteriorly, posteriorly, laterally, medially, superiorly, inferiorly, etc. So this observation of the tricentric condition at the beginning takes us back to the concept of rest. So when we do an anatomical cut, you can see this coronal cut and this sagittal cut, what is that giving us? 
a very interesting situation because the head has to be balanced and it's balanced in this lever observation. But if you look at the center of the lever, this point corresponds exactly to the top of the odontoid process on C2. So your cranium is going to be balanced according to that same principle of 50-50%. The 50% anteriorly and the 50% posteriorly. So if you analyze it in the sagittal observation, the most important point is the top of the odontoid process. And that top of the odontoid process will receive the skeletal midline that divides the system in two. Same thing is going to happen when we look at it in the coronal plane. What are we looking? 50% on the right, 50% of the left. But in relationship to that, the skeletal midline passes again through the top of the odontoid process, which you also see in the sagittal plane, dividing posterior cranial vertebral, anterior cranial mandibular, right cranial mandibular, left cranial mandibular. But if we look at this condition, what is important? That you're looking at it in a black and white picture. But it's interesting to see that if we go back and we go back to the initial observation, we have brain, we have central sensitization. Yesterday, we heard a fantastic lecture on neurology of occlusion, where the most important thing, how the teeth are connected to your central nervous system. So we cannot forget the importance of central nervous system, airway, and the physiology of the mouth. Everything goes together. It's not just the black and white observation. And I can say black and white, coronal, sagittal, and I can refer to you as the 50-50% concept, but I cannot forget one of the most important things is brain. We have central nervous system receiving all the information of every contact of your teeth, sending information to your central nervous system. That's why I want a balanced situation where all the occlusal contacts are going to be, depending on your principles, sending information to the central nervous system. The other important concept, airway. We've been talking about airway for many, many years. This is not new. We started talking about airway, at least in my initial observation, 50 years ago, and the importance of the superior airway space that is so important to maintain a balanced position of the head in relationship to the rest of the body. And finally, you cannot forget the concept of cranial vertebral, cranial mandibular, which are intimately related with the physiology of the mouth, mastication, swallowing, speech, extraoral forces, lip, orbicularis, vaccinator, pharyngeal constrictor muscles, everything is related to maintain this head at rest. So looking at the anatomy of this area, you can see, for instance, this coronal view. It's a posterior anterior observation. But if we look at it from the back, this being occiput, that is on top of it is sitting the cranium, has a vertical connection between basin of occiput, vertically all the way down behind the odontoid process into the vertebral body of C2. It's a vertical relationship that you cannot isolate between the cranium and the body of C2, ligamentous wise. But if you see the arrangement of these ligaments, very interesting. Look at the vertical, but also has an horizontal fibers. And that horizontal fibers have a cruciate alignment that connects occiput behind the dense to the vertebral body and also has an horizontal connection. But if you look at the ligaments, they have the same cruciate alignment. And that's why it's called the cruciate ligament that connects occiput to C2 and atlas to C2 through a transverse ligament. That transverse ligament connects the lateral masses of atlas 
behind the lens and gives you the stability anteriorly, posteriorly of the cranium. So the stability of the cranium is dependent on the cruciate ligament vertically and horizontally. It's a cruciate system. But if you look at the ligaments and you do a bisection between the vertical and the horizontal, it shows two ligaments that are called ailer ligaments. Look at the direction of those ligaments. The bisection connects the odontoid process, connects C2 directly to the condyles of occiput. And this maintains this cranium in an horizontal position. These forces are holding the cranium superiorly, trying to give stability from right to left. So if we have this arrangement, that will allow a stable position of the cranium to the cranial vertebral joints. And that is extremely important in the horizontal position of occiput because it determines the position of the temporal bone on the left and on the right side. What is that connecting to? The importance of the fossa. The fossa is going to be horizontal only if the cranial vertebral joints follows this cruciate system held by the ailer ligaments in an horizontal position. And that will determine the position horizontally of the fossas on the right and on the left. So if you have this arrangement, now you can start thinking, what am I going to do with the condyle on the right and what am I going to do with the condyle on the left to follow that horizontal position of the fossa? If we have this arrangement, the weight of the head is passing right through the center of the skeletal midline. It continues through the body of C2 and transmits the forces basically to the rest of the body. So this is the basic alignment of the cranial vertebral joints to be able to maintain an horizontal position of the cranium. Now this slide is going to be crucial for you. Why? Because if we look at it initially from posterior to anterior, look at the position of the cranium. It will follow a relationship to atlas, a relationship to C2, according to that skeletal midline that passes through the top of the dens, passes through the spinous process. If that happens, and C2 is on a skeletal midline, axis on a skeletal midline, atlas can be horizontal. What is that going to do? It's going to maintain an horizontal position of the cranium, and the mandible can fit in an horizontal position depending on atlas horizontal that is dependent on axis horizontal. Now, the interesting factor is that axis on C3, the facet angles of these facets are in 45 degrees. So that vertebra is not rotating in an horizontal plane, it's rotating on an angular facet of 45 degrees on the right and on the left. So if we look at it on the left picture, you can see that now that spinous process moved towards the left of the skeletal midline. What does that happen? It means that C2 is rotated. But because the spinous process is behind the body of C2, when it goes to the left, the vertebral body of C2 rotates to the right in a 45 degree angulation and causes what is called the angle of the spinous process of C2. If we see it on the right picture, you can see that now the spinous process is to the right. What does that mean? that the spinous process is to the right, but the vertebral body is going to be rotated to the left in a 45 degree angulation. That determines that if on the left picture, the spinous process is to the left, the body is rotated to the right, the left side has to ascend in 45 degrees, but the right side has to descend in 45 degrees and produces a canted position of C2. That position, same thing is going to happen on the other picture where the right side goes up and the left side goes down. 
So it's not an horizontal rotation, it's an angulated rotation in 45 degrees. On the right side, spinous process to the right, vertebral body to the left. On the left, the spinous process is to the left, the vertebral body is to the right. And that causes a canted cranial vertebral angulation. The cranium then is gonna be on the left side, completely rotated to the right and the spinous process to the left. High on the left, low on the right. On the right picture, the cranium is gonna be laterally rotated to the left according to a pure axis of rotation. What does that mean? That the right side is gonna be up and the left side is gonna be down. So we have a canted transverse relationship that will transmit that situation towards the position of the cranium. So here we have a cranial vertebral joint leveled, skeletal midline, everything is horizontal. But what happens if these vertebrae loses their normal alignment? In this case, look how interesting this is. The spinous process of C2 is going to the left, rotated to the right. But now Atlas is high on the right, low on the left, showing that Atlas is rotated to the left while C2 is rotated to the right. Well, one of these two vertebrae that are canted becomes dominant on the position of the transverse occlusal plane and the canted position of the mandible. So the mandible now is adopting a position depending on the position of Atlas. If Atlas is rotated to the left, high on the right, low on the left, that means high on the right, the mandible is going to be up on the right, low on the left. Why? Because the cranium and the transverse occlusal plane, in this case, will be dependent on the position of Atlas. So it could be Atlas or it could be C2. And that's what we see basically in clinical practice. So it follows the same process of the vertebra and how the mandible reacts to that position. So this is my reality of everyday practice. We have a canted mandible dependent on the canted transverse position of atlas in this case, even though axis could be rotated to the opposite side. So high resolution tomography has really helped us in trying to follow these procedures of observation, which are extremely important for rest position of the mandible, occlusal contacts, and also the neurology of cranial vertebral joints. We started this in a very historical way because when we were analyzing cranial vertebral joints through a medical transoral x-ray, we were not looking for the relationship between the maxilla and the mandible or the occlusal context or the transverse occlusal plane. We were looking for traumas to the dents, like a fracture, fractures of the pedicle of C2, bony anomalies or malformations at the level of the cranial vertebral joints through this transoral x-ray. But the observation was way beyond the medical condition of the case. So when we looked at this transoral x-ray and we traced our skeletal midline through the center of the odontoid process, well, we saw that the spinal process is towards the right. The space between the lateral mass of atlas and the odontoid process was wider on the right than the left, which if it's wider on the right, is rotated to the right. The spinous process is to the right, so the body is rotated to the left. So we had a, a misalignment of the position of the cranial vertebral joints. When we saw that, then we started to observe positions of the mandible, and we found that we had a canted transverse occlusal plane. Very interesting. What was this cranial vertebral alignment related 
to the transverse occlusal plane of the mandible. So we said, oh, axis is rotated to the left, high on the right, low on the left. And the transverse occlusal plane was adopting the same position of the canted C2 vertebra. So we saw the spinous process to the right, the body rotated to the left, left rotation of C2. The occlusion was high on the right, low on the left, same as the position of C2. So I measured the position of the spinous process of C2 according to this angle of the spinous process of C2, from the center of the mandible, of the skeletal midline, to the spinous process, and gave me an angle of the spinous process of C2. I measured it, but I also saw that the cranium was canted, the angle of the mandible was canted, and the transverse occlusal plane was canted. But this angle of the canted occlusal plane was proportional with the canted angle of the spinous process of C2. Look how interesting this is. So they move basically, and they go into a canted position proportionally, depending on the amount of rotation that axis in this case could have in using this canted mandibular position. So we took this to the high resolution tomography. And what's interesting- Mariano, five minutes, I'm so sorry to say that. Okay. So if we see this, what we were looking, we were looking at axial, mm -hmm. coronal, sagittal. And when we saw that, then we realized that this took us to the temporomandibular joint. How? Where well, we could see that the temporal fossa were symmetrical, proportional, and allowed the condyles to be proportional on the fossa. So this was actually our centric position of the cranial vertebral joint as a centric relation that allowed us to keep us in a centric relation of the condyles of the mandible in the fossa. How interesting this was, because when we did the anatomical observations dynamically through the high resolution tomography, we could measure the amount of angulation of atlas the amount of angulation on the right and the left, if they were proportional. We could measure according to the skeletal midline, the positions of the spinous process of C2 that gave us an angle of the spinous process. So we needed to level these angulated conditions so that we could take this patient back into this occlusal relationship parallel to the cranial vertebral joints. Interesting in us came the concept of pain. And we saw the trigeminal cervical nucleus related to this. And we saw the convergency of the cervical trigeminal efferents and how they related between the trigeminal nerve and the upper cervical spine. So we saw that there was a connection that was a bi-directional connection between trigeminal one and C1, trigeminal 2 with C2, and trigeminal 3 with C3. So it was a bi-directional interaction. We took that into high-resolution tomography, and we saw a great connection. What was happening at the level of the temporomandibular joints completely related to what's happening to the cranial vertebral joints. And you can see here why or how can you explain that the right temporomandibular joint is absolutely normal in relationship to anatomy and position, but if you look at the left temporomandibular joint, it's completely degenerated. So we said, well, which is the cause? And we could not differentiate one from the other. And we saw the connection bidirectional that what was happening at the level of the cranial vertebral joints was happening at the level of the temporomandibular joints. And what was happening at the level of the temporomandibular joint was also reflected at the level of the cranial vertebral joints. 
So we started to see then that when we did evaluations of occlusal contacts, these patients, every time they came back to occlusal contacts, had a unilateral occlusal contact in the most posterior molar. And all the rest of the occlusion was completely open. And we said, well, how come this occlusal contact is only unilateral and the patient does not have contacts in maximum intercospation? So we analyzed the situation and we saw the degeneration happening at the level of the temporal mandibular joint. Why was that happening? Because the joint was functioning in a position that does not correspond to a normal alignment. So if I look at this dynamic relationship, where we see that most of the joints go into degeneration when they function convex and convex, Look at the space on the right side, doing a lateral movement of the mandible towards the opposite side. Look what happens here on the right side. But look what happens in the same pattern of movement on the left side. You say, why is this degenerating? Why do we have sclerosis? Why do we have subcondyl cysts with compression of joint spaces? And here you see no space. The condyle is moving this way, or the condyle is going down, for me, I have to look at it different. The fossa is away from the condor on the right side, and the fossa is down on the left side. So I said, well, what do I need to do? I need to treat the fossa. How? I have to take the fossa away from the condor on the left side, and I have to bring the fossa towards the condor on the right side. So this is the important thing of this connection that if you don't have actually a really stable fossa, and I see this case after case, we are not gonna have basically occlusal contacts at rest. So just let me give you an example how we can change this situation. Because this for me is very interesting. Look what it says here. You've been talking about this all week, but it says centric relation can change depending on what? On time, direction of the load. So when we see changes of condylar position, look what happens. Now we see degeneration of the condyle, we see degenerations of the eminence. How does it start? It starts with the overloading of the condyle. And that happens with time, direction of the load. That's going to happen if you don't have cranial vertebral joints aligned so that the fossas can be aligned in an horizontal position so later you can set the condos on the fossa. I don't know in which way I'm going to get killed, if from your side or from the other side, but I'm getting into, into turbulence. I love you. I love you. I love you. And I know that this is important. You have... 30 seconds to finish the idea. Okay. Which was the initial cause? The rotation of C2. One, one more thing. Let me go back to this. Patricia, it's a few things that you cannot say to your father, so I'm apologizing okay. in advance. 45 seconds. Rotation of C2. If you look at it, you see on this case, a rotation of atlas towards the left. What is that gonna cause? A fulcrum on the right. Fulcrum on the right, open occlusion on the left. Hyperactivity of the muscles on the left side. What is that gonna cause? The condyle to move down and back on the side of the fulcrum. Which is the cause? The cause is the rotation of atlas. It could be atlas or it could be C2. This is what you have to be aware of. This, this is a fulcrum <laughs> caused by a rotation of a cranial vertebral joint misalignment. Left rotation of atlas, right fulcrum on the right side. The beginning of the problem. So 
this is what you get on the audience most of the time when you talk about fossa. Now, I'm going to show very fast. No, they're going to get killed. Keep material for the course. We're going to yeah. have a course here in Miami, August 12, 13, and 14. We need go to ahead. keep going. Go. Wait, okay, just wait. because you're showing me your butt, that's the only wait, reason wait, that I'm going to... Wait, 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 wait. I still have 15 seconds. What do I want to say with this? If you look at this example, this is a cranial vertebral fulcrum. It's not a dental fulcrum. It could be dental or could be cranial vertebral. So you have to think. How do you have to think? You have to think different. So sometimes we have to go from the opposite end. And usually when I talk about this, this is what I get in relationship to this concept. Very funny faces in a completely different way of observation. Now, we love you. And I love that case so, that we did together over there. So this is my last observation. Don't forget that every time you manipulate a mandible, the cranial vertebral joints are looking at you. So thank you very much. And sorry for being a little bit late. I love you, Patricia. We love you. Thank you so much. <laughs> and then you, you know, Patricia. Always <laughs> learn more. So anyways, my August, I hope after coronavirus we have, but we have this course set up for a year already. So we have a course in Miami, August 12, 13, 14. Uh, for a, I think we have this date for the year already. That's what I just mentioned. Two years we have these dates. So need to have. Okay. All right. I love you. Talk to you later, Mariano. Thank you so much. Besos to Maria and to Lena. Ciao. Patricia. Wait, hold on. Uh, and we have one more winner and one new mm -hmm. participant. You see, Patricia didn't have no hat from Brazil, even that I've been there multiple times.